Hello, I'm Lux, and I'm terrible with a shovel. <laughs> and I'm Ember, and actually, no, he's quite good. The problem is getting out of the holes he digs. And this is our thoughts on My Little Pony, Friendship is Magic, Season 8, Episode 21, A Rock Hoof and a Hard Place. Because puns, why not? The whole series is kind of based on puns. Sometimes they're good, sometimes they're bad, sometimes they're so bad you're like, Ooh, that was a good one. Like, okay, who on MLP is about to be a father? My goodness. <laughs> I still need to show you that comic sometime. I don't know how you would look it up, but it basically is this guy. His girlfriend goes, I have something to tell you. The guy makes a pun. And then he goes, I'm a father. <laughs> so now to the actual MLP episode, which I thought was pretty well handled, though there was some parts where I'm like, Hmm, where are they going with this? This is kind of cringy, not really hard cringy, but they seem to be taking a while to get to the point. I know we had to fill 22 minutes, but though I gotta say that this is this was a good way to show what the other pillars were up to. Because so far in this season, we've only seen Star Swirl, and this allowed us to get a quick recap of not only where the pillars are, but what they're doing. Because we need to know where our two power teams are all split up. Because you know the finale is going to require the student six. So we have to make sure that the pillars and the main six are sufficiently scattered. And just how he is trying to find out where he fits in. And how he's like, especially when he was first introduced with how he was interacting with the archaeology dig. Because <laughs> to him, all this stuff was like just yesterday kind of thing so it's not ancient to him no so it's like come on let's dig out the village because oh yeah something happened let's dig out the village just like you would after you know a heavy blizzard so he's like no, i don't need to preserve this stuff i just want to bring it back so i can use it again and start inviting people to live here yep nope it belongs in a museum <laughs> thank you winning anna jones why did it have to be snakes because reasons. He is quite dangerous with that shovel, too. He, he broke the ground. He broke the stage. He broke walls. And most of that was without trying. Like I think he just walked through the doorway. Because he's basically the largest pony we've ever seen. And that's including the Saddle Arabians, who are taller. It, he is like pure Budweiser Clydesdale. And I think that's... Kind of goes back to his legend, because I think he's actually magically enhanced, and he's still not quite used to his body yet. Well, he could be, but the modern world appears to be a little more crowded. Hmm. I think that may have even been mentioned in the episode where the pillars came back, and they had to go to areas where Shadow was, and they couldn't find Shadow. And I think he went with them to, like, Manhattan, and he was like, wow, this place is really packed. Because that tends to be how things go. As time goes by, the overall population increases because of improvements in medicine and nutrition and farming. All of those things contribute to improved lifestyle, which means longer lifespans, which means a higher population. And just how <laughs> Yuna kind of got a crush on the teacher. Yeah, insta-crush. Because... He's big like Yak and strong like Yak and apparently also smells like Yak. That is not a Yak. I love that. He's perfect. <laughs> Day could not get better. <laughs> Shovel. Day just got better. <laughs> also, it was very impressive how he tossed all of them and they landed quite gently. Apparently, he really knows how to use that shovel. Also, apparently Spike and Smolder have fire breathing competitions. All the time, and I don't think I've ever seen Spike breathe orange flame. Yeah, I, I thought it may have been just like some thing going on in a lab or something. Something that was absolutely normal. Because of the way Twilight and Applejack were reacting, it was absolutely normal because they weren't freaked out. Yes, I already know the answer is plot, but she's a freaking alicorn. She couldn't have just done the whole magical force field and held Rockhoof still and stopped him. 
Yeah, we have a lot of that. It's like you, you do realize when you have characters like that, you, you have to utilize them or give a good valid reason why you're not utilizing them. Maybe she felt it was impolite? Well, it's impolite for him to interrupt the contest, and it's impolite for him to interrupt the students' classes. It's impolite of him to mess up the fountain. Hmm. And not to mention ruining quilts. Then go back earlier to uh, destroying Rarity's decorative centerpieces. <laughs> oh, an apple crunch. This is wood! Knock. Wasn't that one centerpiece? But Rarity says plural, so maybe there were multiple components to it, so to her it counted as several. Also, you have a sense of smell. I'm pretty sure the apple did not smell like an apple. Unless Rarity cast up a spell on it to give off kind of a potpourri thing going on. In which case it would probably smell like potpourri, not necessarily like apples. I was saying potpourri as to give an idea of like lots of smells coming from me. Ah. As you walk by, you get a whiff of apples and cinnamon. But then you find out, like, no, this is a wax apple. And it was a wood apple, which I'm trying to figure out why. Because you, wouldn't you use wax fruit? Um, dragon students? Yeah, well, a wood apple would still, you know. <laughs> but the wax would melt in heat. We don't know what temperature the school is kept at. Hmm. Yeah, you want to, you know, last with not too much maintenance. Also, if some student knocked the wax one over, it'd probably smush. The wood can take a little more damage. Hmm. And over time, with, like, aging and stuff like that, it may even look better. It may not look like fruit anymore, but it would look like a nice artistic decorative piece. It might get a nice patina or something, depending on the paints or stains used. Also, I hope there were food-safe paints or stains, considering Rock Hoof bit into the apple. Yeah, and then send it flying, blasting off again. Going back to the plot of this one, I obviously knew that it was going to be something to do with his storytelling. I just couldn't figure out what, if it's, it was going to be storytelling overall, or if they could get something else out of it. Like he would storytell to the students at the school as a teacher that way. Just They would just give him an outdoor arena. Because notice he didn't break anything when he was retelling the story outside, where he had plenty of room to move around. And... You know, there's no reason he couldn't work with a historian to tell all those stories to the historian who could then write them down in a collection because even if some of the tales are less true, there's still a lot of value in recording folklore. I also, going back to stories, I also like the fact that the um, little guy, can't remember his name right now, has published three books. Stygian. Yeah. Prolific little writer there. Yeah. Well, you know, he was kind of the brains behind the pillar operation. Hmm. And he was the one who didn't really have magic or a sacred item or anything. So, yeah. What's an ex-strategist going to do? He's either going to keep being a strategist or he's going to come up with something else. Me and my shadow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Kind of hit the nail kind of hard on the head there. Just a little bit. I mean, especially look at that cover art. But, you know, if uh, Daring Do can write true-to-life stories, why not Stygian? I still find it funny that no one believes that those are real, but Daring Do stories are. That's, that's great. <laughs> like, how do you keep something like that a secret? Does she, like, have an in with Celestia or something? And Celestia goes, oh, no, those are fake. Because, I mean, I was like, Caballeron and Azicotl, uh, have they, like, never seen the books? You would think at the very least they would sue her. Yeah, I don't think they have, based on, I believe, Caballeron? Yeah, when he was in the episode. Yeah, he, he was like, what are these people doing? <laughs> but still, it's like, how and why would you decide to do that? And if you, as an author, decided to do that, wouldn't... You at least, you know, go the fan fiction route of, oh, no, it's not really Daring Do. I changed the name. I almost think, like, maybe the first book was kind of an accidental thing. She decided to write down a serious, like, notes and everything like that, and it got published, and somehow it got put in the fiction section, so everyone assumed it was fiction. Or they read it and thought it was in the wrong section, and went, oh, this, is, this must be fiction. Like, it's not possible. I mean, especially with the way Rarity said, oh, everything's so... Over the top. 
uh, like coming from an element of harmony. Yeah, you you literally watch Twilight Sparkle do a Dragon Ball Z fight with a giant creature. So a little over the top. Yeah. I think there should have been more trouble than just Rock Hoof, though we did see some trouble with Star Swirl of adjusting to the modern era because everything you know is gone. I mean, even if you can find meaningful work, languages change over time, social norms change over time, the fact that all your friends are dead. And I like how they even point out the fact that the stars move a little bit over time. So literally nothing's the same. I mean, a lot of sci-fi novels deal with that when people have been cryogenically frozen. I remember one where it was done for medical reasons because they were hoping for a cure later. And the scientists are like, well, if we unfreeze them now, they're not going to be able to adapt because they would do it and then people couldn't adapt. Hmm. There are even episodes of Futurama with that. I mean, Fry does really well because he's Fry, but there was this girl that he liked that ends up showing up for an episode and she could not deal. Also, there's Khan from Star Trek. In their actual series, he was cryogenically frozen, brought back. I think it was even an episode of TNG where that happens as well, where a bunch of people who were uh, frozen in pods and in space, and once there was a cure found, they would be brought back, and now they're like, we don't know what to do. Actually, even in one of the movies, not a cryogenically frozen person, but a doctor from modern times in that era was brought back to the future with the crew, with the captain. I think it was like Voyage Home, the one with the whales. So it's a rather common theme in sci-fi and fantasy, because how often as the hero in a game or story have you just suddenly woken up Here's your sword, go save the world. It's also a great trope to be able to um, introduce the audience to the world. Because if the main character doesn't know what the world is, you can actually just get the world explained to them without... Sitting there doing talking heads and just informing the audience. That's why you have, a lot of times, your main characters not being familiar. That's why Harry Potter doesn't know he's a wizard. He can be told about being a wizard so that we, the audience, can learn about being a wizard. And going back to the... Time travel thing, just real quick. I've been hearing about this book I need to look up where apparently this guy who's a military, a very low level military strategist, ends up being trapped in some type of time thing and he ends up going to the future where no one knows how to strategize and they're still fighting space battles, but they're fighting them in a 2D plane. They think they have to point at each other in a certain way because they never got taught basic strategy and tactics, especially not advanced strategy and tactics for space battles. And so he wakes up and knows this stuff and he ends up becoming a captain and reteaching everyone how to do this stuff. This is like a really interesting concept. Like this guy who's like was okay in his time ends up being really good in the time he ends up in. So sci-fi and fantasy aside... Just changing times and not fitting in are very relatable themes because, okay, 20 years ago, 56K modems were awesome. <laughs> Aww. I'm laughing because I was stuck on those for so long. And now we have companies working on rolling out 5G. Yeah, which is gigabit Ethernet wireless if you're standing close enough to the tower and there's no building in the way. But a huge difference in a relatively short time span. And when you look at Rock Hoof, out of all of the pillars, he was kind of the manual labor. He has a shovel. He's a ditch digger. If you take that literally, go forward in time, nobody digs by hand. They use a backhoe. Mm. So he's kind of feels like a relic. He's out of place. You know, he's that retired general that doesn't know how to do anything but be a general. Go watch White Christmas. I know it's not Christmas yet, but go watch White Christmas. It's a good movie. And it touches on this theme. I also need to watch Holiday Inn again sometime because I barely remember it. Uh, White Christmas gets played more often, probably because it's in color. Mm. Also, it's very Christmas focused where Holiday Inn covers all the holidays. So it's like, well, when do you show it? Because it has all of them. 
You show it in between holidays. You, you know in those holidays we don't celebrate anymore because Christmas runs them over? So, yeah, and then just all the things they try for Rock Hoof and, oh, I felt so bad for Cranky. I'm like, wow, that's right a callback to when Cranky was first introduced to the series. This donkey's really bald! And now he has a rash. Oh, the pony just kind of sidestepped away. And he's like, oh, when he hides behind his newspaper. It's just like, there has to be something physical that he could do other than what they figured out but there was also that whole uh, term right now is social media thing of everyone else is doing better than me because he went and saw his friends and they were all appeared to be doing better than him flash went right back into what he was doing and got a command uh mist main went into a new avenue but still creating beauty so nebula figured out an entirely new job well, we don't really know what Cinebula did back then other than pass a test of faith. And Meadowbrook, apparently all of her recipes are still quite valid. Mm. So apparently, even though there's been improvements in medicine, her stuff's still good. Well, she may be able to treat other ailments that science hasn't bothered to tackle yet. Or her stuff can improve what medical science currently does for ponies a lot of possibilities there and we already talked about um stygian because they didn't bother to actually show him they just showed that he was being successful just like we didn't see star swirl because star swirl's traveling so it would be harder to find him in theory and we've seen enough of him in the series already that the writers probably felt that he didn't need they didn't need to reintroduce him in this episode so they were able to quickly catch everyone up. And I know Pinkie Pie is officially the liaison to Yak Yakistan, but I'm pretty sure that Rockhoof would enjoy Yak Yakistan. Oh yeah, they'd probably enjoy him a lot too, just like Yuna. Yes, because storytelling is a traditional Yak pastime. And he could so like Yak Smash. Uh, so are the Yaks like Hulk? Maybe. Except they don't have to be angry to smash things. They smash things when they're happy, too. They smash a lot of things. Even it's fun. I like how they also used her to give another... Like, I was different, too. I found friends. Because that holds true for any of the non-pony student six. But it works well coming from Yona because she's over... She's larger compared to... The other students, overall stronger, a lot more focus on the physical. Hmm. So she and Rockhoof have a lot of that in common. Also, is it just me or is the Griffin kind of being a lot like the Zatch? Not Zatch. Zach? Yeah, the Zach Morris. Yeah, he seems to be like the Zach Morris of this group. Because he's like, oh, I can take advantage of this. Yeah, we don't have homework. And... All our classes constitute field trips. <laughs> I like how Spike was, yeah, no. Because I think I had my eyes closed when that happened. And I thought Spike was like, yeah, no, I, I know this. I know the routine. That nice try, Gallus. But really? No, well, you thought it wouldn't hurt because like, hey, another substitute teacher. Yeah, but come on, it's Spike. Spike's been at the school Mm hmm. He lives with Twilight. You would think Gallus would have thought it through a little bit with Spike. Because what you do is you tone it down a little bit. You say, oh, yeah, we just finished turning in our project, so we don't have anything that we have to work on right now. Of course, Spike would probably also say, that's not what the notes say. Nice try. But it would have shown more creativity. Hmm. I wonder if we'll ever get him stopping time like that. <laughs> yes, Morris time. An incredibly useful power. Which I can't remember for how many seasons it was used in. I think it was like only one season where it was like really used heavily. And I don't remember much of that afterwards. Uh, I think they kept kind of changing their mind what direction they wanted to go and what aspects they wanted to focus on. I just remember watching that series all the way to the end. And I'm not just talking about the... Uh, Younger years. I'm talking about like when they went to, I think there was a portion where they were at college. 
and then I think it was a made for TV movie where mm -hmm. two of the characters got married. And I loved how Twilight, you know, phrased it, official keeper of tales. And Spike is like, can you do that? She's like, yeah. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, probably not. And I'm guessing it's kind of a meaningless title, but he's Rock Hoof. He would be a great bard. Traveling around, telling stories. Hmm. Can't play an instrument, but boy, can he encourage people. Well, I mean, bard in terms of entertainer. To travel around, he's perfectly well suited to travel on his own. And to be able to tell the same stories over and over to different audiences. Mm-hmm. I suddenly got this image. Of, it's a common meme of, we found our bard! Mm-hmm. <laughs> When a particular person like starts telling a story and something in a thread, like we found the bard. <laughs> well, I still really enjoy uh, Praline from Bravely Default. Ah, oh, I barely remember that. I feel so sad. I need to play that game again. Her official title was performer. Are we talking about a villain? Of course. Okay, just wanted to make sure because I suddenly remembered her now. I think that's where you get a job. Is that where you get the performance job? Uh-huh. Okay. I remember now. Yeah, see how many things this single episode reminds us of? That's all the tangents. Normally we tangent when we hate an episode. Hate in air quotes there. But this just brings up so many other things. Similarities in different media, common threads. And we know you probably stopped listening ten minutes ago, but... The art's still going. Hey, I, I have control over the horizontal, the vertical. <laughs> Actually, it's progressive scan now, so... Eh. Twilight Zone. I heard there's a great series. If you like the Twilight Zone, there's a modern one called Black Mirror. I haven't seen it myself, but I heard it's really good. Shall we wrap things up? I was thinking of saying that myself. Any final thoughts before we dive off into the unknown? To know the unknown, yes, I, I watched that particular Pokemon movie. But moving on to, this has been our thoughts on My Little Pony, Friendship is Magic, Season 8, Episode 21, A Rock Hoof in a Hard Place. Hey, thanks for listening and staying to the outro. Uh, not much changes here, but we do still record it uniquely every time, except for the thank you at the end. That just came out really well, so we kind of just keep reusing it. Come on. We have a lot of original content. We can recycle some of the credits. So, like, share, subscribe, comment. Yes, I know we're a little behind on replying to comments. <laughs> but we have read them. We promise. We love you all. In that purely platonic, you know, enjoying the fandom type of way. Once you're ready to leave YouTube, we have links for that. There's links to Lex's art, Lex's Patreon, Lex's coffee, probably some Amazon links, maybe linking back to the episodes or some relevant product placements. And yeah, I, I took over a corner of Lex's Tumblr. I, I need some suggestions of, I need to know what your favorite Starbucks drink is so I can hack it for you. Thank you so much for watching and listening. We appreciate all of the support that we receive in the form of views, likes, comments, dialogue, suggestions, and of course financially as well. But all of it is truly appreciated. Thank you to all of our supporters, subscribers, etc. in whatever form you choose to grace us with your presence.